Wonderful. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, I might sit down just because I'm actually a bit ill. And, um, you know, I, I apologize because this is going to be one of these beautiful rare moments where you're not going to get to see energetic era. You're going to see sick zombie era. <laughs> um, but, you know, <clears throat> and I'm going to be talking about how one open source product made it big. But, you know, in government, not like, not like big, big. <laughs> So uh, my name is Ira. Uh, I'm Shevsky on GitHub, Mastodon Social, Scuttlebutt, Twitter, uh, wherever else. Um, also called, also known as Irina Bolichevsky. And I mostly work as a digital strategist and a data consultant um, with mostly governments and companies on everything from GDPR to data policies and digital transformation. And I'm also the co-founder and director of Redecentralized.org, which is a community around um, promoting and supporting open decentralization efforts to tackle uh, the closed proprietary monopoly capture of our digital infrastructure, uh, which is actually a topic I will be talking about um, at the next month's <laughs> British Computer Science Society, uh, where I will be talking about my campaign around uh, the role that open standards and interoperability need to play to start um, leveling the playing field against Facebook and Twitter and Google and everything else. So, you know, please come along to that if I don't put you off completely today. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about CCAN uh, which is, you know, if you look at the website, the world's leading open source data portal platform um, that powers the European data portal. It's uh, kind of, it was a project that I came across in 2011. Um, so really nine years ago and was started in 2007. Um, and it's really quite a big deal now. I'm just going to say I looked at Stack Overflow earlier and there had been sort of three separate questions just in the last two days and I scrolled through and most of them get answered and um, it's used by hundreds of governments and organizations I wanted to kind of show you uh, some of the instances so this is there's only there's like 200 listed here some of them are going to be out of date but there's many many more I know many governments and organizations that use CCAN uh, mostly because they tend to um, harass me uh, because one of the things that I'm actually um, known for is being one of the leaders of CCAN. And they'll be like, do you have a CCAN dev that you can send us as if I keep a secret supply in my closet? Um, and I don't. Uh, so, so it's actually used by, um, so to the question around developing countries by kind of um, organizations all over the world. I think it's, it's really quite extraordinary. And um, many national governments, um, uh, data.gov quite famously, uh, data.gov UK now uses the API on the back end, but it used to use it on the front end. Um, and, and kind of uh, Estonia, Sweden, uh, all kinds of uh, organizations. I did want to show you some of the cool ones, uh, which I'd sort of lined up on my laptop, but uh, it might be a bit of a pain to try and find it um, here. So I, I might have to skip that oh actually wait wait wait, wait. I'm maybe i'll show you, show you just one i think i know where it is um, um two seconds two seconds i'm gonna look up the uh url i know this is not as polished as terence terence has done a terrible thing and shown me up horribly um by just being super great, but I'm just gonna say, you know, I did not realize that was the standard. <laughs> if I if I had, I would have said no. <laughs> oh, oh man, it's so unpolished here. But anyway, I'm not gonna share you hum data. It's an amazing site though. The um, uh, it's uh, it's called the. Um, HDX site and it kind of uses CCAN, but it also visualizes really incredible uh, live data. So right now there's a really interesting uh, data set around the coronavirus, which I do not have, mm -hmm. um, which uh, which kind of uses all of the functionality and shows you a bit more of what CCAN is. 
And uh, one of the other things that's kind of really amazing from a um, open source perspective is the hundreds of extensions that exist. Um, I think uh, there's um, a few listed here, um, but it's it's actually quite um, incredible matching extensions. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> um, there we go. Uh, yeah, and um, you know everything from like what NHS England have done to to all kinds of people, um, companies. You know, and this these are people registering extensions that they have built this um, piece of software on the website, and uh, it's it's like it's like yeah, it's super cool. Okay, here we go. So, uh, so what is it? I'm gonna. It's it's essentially a data management um, piece of software. It's used to um, often just manage metadata. Uh, it helps data discovery. So there's a solar index um, tagging, all kinds of stuff, um, and publication of data sets on the internet. Uh, so it's used for data, data portals. Um, it has been used in many places to drive transparency. So publishing budgets, spending data, all kinds of things, and also collaboration and engagement with data. Um, it all started uh, many, many years ago, 20, uh, 2007, at the Open Knowledge Foundation. This is the old logo, which is a nonprofit and a global network that was sort of using advocacy and technology to open up knowledge and empower people. Uh, so it was a project very much uh, driven by a set of idealists and activists. And the fact that it managed to get adopted and used and known all over the world um, despite being a kind of crazy bunch of uh, underfunded radicals is is incredible. And that's sort of what I want to talk to you about today. So how did it start? So this this is this is the data hub um, when it was visually significantly improved from when I first saw it. Um, so I'm just have a look at this and imagine something a good order of magnitude uglier mm -hmm. and more confusing. And that was my first um, experience of CCAN. And it was actually, it's called CCAN after CPAN, Comprehensive Pearl Archive Network. The idea was to have a Debian for data, sort of people collaborating on data together. And it was very much um, sort of about how can we get people to do versioning and revisioning of data and collaborate together and, and see it. And uh, it was a really brilliant um, kind of vision that sadly didn't really have much uh, funding or, or really traction around uh, with people. And when I joined um, in 2011, I joined as the first non and only non-technical sort of non-programmer so it was just a small band of developers um and there were a whole series of challenges one which is really clarity so there wasn't a website no one knew what it was when i asked people what is it they were like well you know it's a solar package manager some <laughs> was like what solar what pa solar index of a package what manager and i was like okay okay cool so who, who's it for they were like well everybody you know we can, we can, we can all benefit uh, from from this. Um, and so, data.gov the UK was where using it on the back end, and that was really the the, the source of funding and the um, um, the kind of momentum that it had. But there was a lot of competition in the data portal space. There were kind of VC funded startups um, shooting up that were uh, that was what data.gov was using. There wasn't very good branding. CCAN, as you know, the name was a bit of a problem and the team was quite limited. Uh, so it's quite a small team. So um, how did it go from this sort of quite scary, ugly looking, strange thing that was many things to many to some people um, into <laughs> the, um, the very well known, very widely adopted uh, piece of software that it is today? And I'm going to talk about a range of things, which um, again, visually not very stunning, is going to be some words that I'm going to talk to. So <clears throat> some of the interventions that I decided to make, and again, this was a choice, so it could have been even better without this. And, and I would like to sort of acknowledge that um, there was a huge, incredible team and many people who worked on this from Rufus to uh, John Bywater to obviously Tim Berners-Lee, who uh, 
um, launch data.gov.uk in the first place to um, others who, 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 who made it all happen. But one thing that I did do was come in and decide that we need to focus. And I think this was one of the most important interventions. So I very much uh, made quite a difficult call, which is to say, I'm sorry, it's not going to be um, a collaborative uh, data experience where we all kind of contribute and edit data together. I was like, I don't know who these people are. I haven't met them. And buzz data exists and isn't sort of working out. So I very much decided it's going to be um, a product for governments. And what we were going to do was actually focus the messaging, the branding, and some of the feature set on making something that looked coherent um, and was for governments. The second thing was very much the context was incredibly important at the time. So this was uh, 2011 when I was there, and um, Gordon Brown had recently... Uh, made a big speech, uh, put a bunch of money aside for data.gov UK, had said, we're going to use open source because it's sort of free and um, we're going to empower citizens and we're going to do democracy. And Neely Cruz, which, who was the vice um, uh, president commissioner at the European Commission, also made a kind of famous speech, open data is the new oil, it's going to power our economies. There was a huge amount of political policy pressure to for uh, for governments and departments to do something around open um, data and transparency and that made that market an incredibly important one and one that is worth looking at the third thing I actually think that is um, was one of the most important interventions was was focusing on how something looks um, so there is there is a difference between showing people something that looks like this and showing people that uh, something that looks just slightly different. Um, and it has kind of very similar functionality, but is a little bit more shiny on top and has little steps, has buttons, has kind of descriptions. And it just has a cleaner interface and people start understanding what it is. The um, I kind of created a small team where I hired um, a UX designer developer that I knew before. Um, so I had a kind of backend developer, front end developer, and a designer, and we basically completely redesigned uh, CCAN to uh, a new interface that actually is still in use by most of the kind of community sites. They will just use the um, original theme, even though we also made sure that there were a whole bunch of changes to make it much more themable. But suddenly, the kind of these small changes. Um, made a huge impact in us actually being able to um, get people to take CCAN seriously as a potential product. The fourth thing was narrative. Um, so a lot of the discussions that um, I saw was very much, here are all these features. Here's what the API can do. Um, here's like all of this different bits of documentation. And there wasn't very much focus on, well, who, what are the benefits and who does it benefit? Um, what does this mean? Uh, to to which users. So having a narrative that looked at benefits was something that wasn't part of the language of um, these these sort of sets of people, and and that that was something that um, I focused on on the website. And also, like the narrative really matters. So when we talked about open data, and there was a lot of policy um, decisions to how about open data was really powerful actually connecting open source to open data was something that worked incredibly well. So when I would go and talk to um, governments around the world, you know, I would say, hi, you're doing open data and that's really incredible. Why would you have it on a closed platform? Like, you know, let's, let's talk about what that means. Let's talk about what that means when all the visualizations that people create or the insights is actually owned by some company and isn't being used to benefit. If we're thinking about what the values of open data are, it must be on open source. And that's something that really landed. The third, uh, the sixth, fifth, fifth thing, the next thing is, um, and this is, I think, really fundamental around government, which is government is one of these crazy beasts where the people who run the software, the people who are the beneficiaries of the software, 
the citizens, the developers, the new entrepreneurs, and the people who like sign the check and who actually decide are very different. They're very different stakeholder groups. And who you sell to really matters. And I saw that some of the other organizations and competitors, um, they were sort of very much selling just at the, at the budget holders. They were just like, this is what we're going to give you. And they absolutely would ignore the kind of actual end user functionality or um, like how easy it was actually to install or run or maintain or something else. And one of the things that CCAN did was actually have something that um, was an offer to all of those three groups. So there was a clear message and there were different messages to the people who signed the budgets, but also to the uh, people who needed to run it. Um, it was open source that had a community. We focused on the community and we included and responded to them and um, made sure they were well looked after. And we also tried to think about the sort of end beneficiaries, the citizens, the, the potential researchers or the developers who might be using this. Um, celebrity culture. This is this is huge. I mean, genuinely, I, I don't know how anything moves in this world anymore unless like Taylor Swift is on it or whatever. But um, <clears throat> one, one of the most important um, aspects, and I think actually this is the thing that made CCAN really win was um, I was thinking, well, who are the who are the cool kids on the open data block? Like, who are the you know who are the celebrities here? And at the time, it was very much the U.S. and the U.K. government. So I actually spent most of my time getting the U.K. government to use CCAN on the front end and convincing the U.S. government that despite their various promises and despite uh, the the fact that their very well funded VC funded uh, kind of company was providing them a great service, what they really wanted to do. <laughs> was moved to CCAN and uh, and they did and after that actually a lot of people um, follow through so you know if, if you're thinking about well how do you get products into government you know or any sector it's very much who who is seen as the leaders who are the people that everyone notices and if they use your stuff then then that's honestly everyone else just sort of copies um, sad but true don't tell I told you. Don't tell anyone I told you. you know, internet. Uh, reputation. So one of the biggest ways in which um, obviously you get things into government is you fill in a request for proposal. You write a lot of documentation, sometimes um, 50 pages of stuff and proposals. And most people think that's all you need to do. It's really not like that. It's actually quite a closed community and your reputation and brand really matters. So even though all of the different um, portals and sites that uh, ended up using CCAN, I almost certainly did write very long but excellent RFP uh, uh, proposals too, I'd also had the ones that we won, I'd also that had talked and met the people. I had given workshops in that country. I had done, whether it was like keynotes or something else or trainings or various community activism. And as a project that was within um, a nonprofit that was also pushing for open data more broadly, we managed to have a reputation that was much, much better than the comp competition. So there were people, you know, I'd go into meetings kind of by myself to the European Commission and they'd say, oh, we just had Socrata with like 10 people in suits and there's just you. Are you sure there's no one else? And uh, people were quite concerned. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, we managed to kind of walk that line and say, well, right, but we're the real deal. Like, and we know what we're talking about and we have this huge international community and we have this reputation and ha doing all of those talks and workshops and actually contributing to the broader movement really paid off. Uh, the team was vital. Um, so actually I found that having knowledge and skills and authenticity about what we were doing was absolutely just fundamental. Um, there was a time where I tried to hire a much more experienced salesperson to take over sales. And um, despite like really trying to help this person eventually had to fire uh, because it was just not working. And actually, 
for whatever it is that you're doing, you have to be passionate and you have to understand what you're doing. And it's not just about the skills. It is also about the expertise and it is also about what you're selling. And I think open source maybe has that a lot more than other things because you're really, you're also, um, you're also trying to sell uh, a kind of a set of values and a way of doing things. And if you don't really get it on some level, I think I think that 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 shows. Um, and lastly, one of the main things that uh, I also focused on was professionalism. So everyone kind of was worried that Zcan was kind of held together by strings and glue and and hackers, and and that was true. But <laughs> but 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 what I did after creating a nice shiny website was also creating a, a price list and and starting to work with people to think about what actually it would take for us to do a certain feature what were the estimates what was realistic what was not what was sustainable and having a much much more professional offering and government you know and building that trust with governments that yes we were a kind of activist nonprofit, but also we could provide a really reliable professional service um what was 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 the thing that matters and i think most importantly, and lastly, in my sort of hot takes from for, of Seacan success, is that all of these things reinforced each other. So I didn't do anything that didn't reinforce some other bit. Like I absolutely, and that goes back to the focus. You cannot do something that is just yes, that would have been nice, um, you know, because it would have been nice to do uh, data versioning. It would have been nice to do other things, but you know, everything that. Everything that I focused on and did with the team absolutely helped the other parts of the strategy work. It was all of those things aligned and were coherent together. Um, I, I started doing some arrows, but there's more. And just imagine like a whole world world of arrows on this on this page. Um, but but these but these things do reinforce each other. And and in any kind of strategy, especially when you're trying to get adoption and beat the odds, you you can't afford to do sort of random things. So within those three years um, that I, that I joined, we actually managed to get over 25 nation uh, states to use CCAN on like on official government websites. Um, that's huge. That's like a random open source project that within a very short period of time suddenly became a standard, suddenly became the default. Uh, by the time that I left, five companies uh, were literally, their whole business was providing CCAN services. That's um, a lot of money. And there was an international community and brand awareness of a, a very oddly named project um, all over the world. Um, it wasn't all easy and there were lots and lots of mistakes, which I'm not gonna go into, Ultimately, it was quite unsustainable. We tried to, um, you know, we tried to do sort of SaaS, uh, which has succeeded since, but the time was really hard uh, because I was running around vaguely doing uh, five jobs and we didn't get a sort of reliable income stream that would allow us to invest into core. And we also, because of that, skipped a lot of steps. We didn't do enough user research. We didn't do service design. We didn't keep all the tech up to date. And that was like, that was really sad. And, you know, if there was a way to redo that, I would. However, right now, it still exists. Adria, who's amazing, committed something five hours ago. This is, this is live, guys. And, you know, it's been forked over, you know, over a thousand times. It's had over 20,000 commits and over 200 contributors. And it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. So it was totally worth it. And uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Craig Allen, Open NMS. Um, so uh, you're built on top of solar, which is a very established and well known project in its own right. Uh, do you think having a good architectural base was important to the success of the project or could you have hacked it together and sort of gone to market with something that didn't have that underlying uh, infrastructure as part of it? So, um, so, so we used a number of like really well established um, like 
uh, over, over so, so solar, obviously Postgres and um, and other things that we then also built and did sort of hack together. Um, I would say that the very deep functionality that CCAT provided um, on on top of some things that you could just get out of the box, like some of the data harvesting we do, or or was very important. But um, I don't think that was the reason for its success. I I would say like so the things that I talked about were were kind of the non technical things, and I think technically. It was, it's a good project and it, it's really powerful and it's incredibly well done. It's a, it's kind of out of date in some ways, but the reason it persists is that um, people now trust, it has a trust and it has a brand and it has a community and extensions um, and a depth to it. Um, you know, and having been around for over 10 years, there's a lot that's kind of gone into the thought um, of how some of these things work that is is really hard to replicate if you're just starting from scratch, which I think pe lots of people have done. Lots of people. I mean, CCAN people got frustrated with. There's a DCAN, a Drupal version. There's a KCAN. There's a JCAN. There's a there's like ten different spin-offs. There's people who just rewrote everything in Node.js. There's you know, and a lot of these things haven't lasted. Um, and again, that comes back to who are the people who are using it? Who you know, the, the celebrities or whatever, the the community, the 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 depth of the thing, the trust and the reputation. Um, but yes, also obviously relying on um, well-established, well-supported things like Solar are also part of it. But I think it's like it's a bit of a magic mix. Any other last non-last questions? Andy and Simon. How, how do you um how do you get the celebrities? There's not that many, and you've got to get lots of them, right? Um, by being wonderfully charming <laughs> and competent. Um. So you mentioned that it was is it kind of like a domino effect of when people see another big player using it, they they get on board quite easily. What have you got any tips for getting the first big player? Because it seems like there's, there's a lot of a lot of people are scared to be the first to move for these sorts of things. I love that you just repeated Andy's question in this in a slightly in a slightly different way. Um, so okay, so genuinely, um, this is kind of what this is about, which is which is how how was it possible to get that kind of initial um, adoption that would sort of cascade down to a kind of more global phenomenon. And, um, you know, and I think there was a lot of this. There's the, the fact that it was really clear what it was and the narrative that it was aimed at governments. There was a focus and a narrative which wasn't there initially because it could have been lots of different things. The context was there. You know, what, for example, data.gov and data.gov UK were doing in terms of the policy pressures, the strategic kind of goals that they had, and the kind of that multi you know, multi-stakeholder offer, like actually genuinely thinking about who are the beneficiaries, who's going to have to run it, who are the people who signed the check, what did they need to do, um, the professionals and the team, and the visuals, like, and the visuals really matter. And I mean, I think this is one thing that I found in, especially in open source communities, um, with, with really centralized, where it's lots of like, um, hackers kind of building the, the future better internet is a lot of it's really ugly and it's really hard to sell ugly software that no one understands um, to people who who aren't the same you know who aren't the same people who are people in government who are the, the budget uh, holders so I, I think that a lot of this um, was went into that uh, initial thing but there's more to it, which is it's relationships and trust. Um, so you need these things in order to be able to build the relationship and trust, but it is relationships and trust. Um, uh, that's how we're a social species and that's, that's how we make decisions. So if you don't have any of this in place, then you can obviously be knocked down. But if you've, even if you have it and you're not able to talk to people, and uh, care about them and care about what they need and care about where they're at, 
um, then then you will struggle. Possibly, unless you've got just millions and billions of dollars in funding, which I did not, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> Sorry for that one. A question from the internet. Uh, James Arthur Cattell asks, uh, how does Shevsky feel about the current direction of hashtag open data and DataGov UK in the UK government, please? I mean, that is that is not a nice, nice question. Um, I have feelings about it. Um, I am no longer actively involved <laughs> in the open data. Or, or GDS or Data.gov UK. Um, um, what I'm gonna, what, what, what I think, um, what I will say is that um, open data is a means, not an end, right? There is a vision of a better world where people are more empowered, they have the information that they uh, want and need that we have a thriving economy based on in, you know uh, data that we don't duplicate research that we have better research and better insights because we can find um, and collaborate all this kind of information and open data is a means to that but it doesn't deliver it um, in the case of genuine accountability you need civil society and civic institutions that actually hold whether it's government or companies to account using open data and um, that do something about it that you need to have sources of power outside of that government uh, in order for um, to, to kind of provide, provide economic benefits you need the, the reliability and the trust that the data will be there and will persist and is reliable and good enough um, in order for you to have some, some other benefits you know Open data is, is part of it, but it's not the whole picture. And one of the things that I think is really wonderful is people are starting to see that more and invest in that more, but we're not really there yet. And a lot of governments, and I don't think the UK is, is particularly bad, actually, um, compared to many, they will spend all of their budget and all of their sort of uh, time and energy setting up an open data portal, throwing some data sets on there, and that's it. And it's like, no, that should be, you know, that should be at most 20% of your budget. The rest of the time should be spent on engagement, on talking to people, on consultations, on telling people what's there, on improving on and creating those feedback loops between the data that people publish, um, how it's created, how it's maintained and, and its users. And I don't think CCAN has necessarily um, been able to provide that. And I think there are a lot of reasons why it wasn't and why we started with something simple that people could buy, but there was always a broader vision behind it, um, which has not been realized, which, uh, which I'm incredibly sad about as someone who was involved in the, in the early days. Um, so I don't know, James, I hope that <laughs> vaguely answers your, your question. Okay. <laughs>